Greetings, Bill Mobley for the Compassion Beyond Borders series. This is sponsored by the Sanford Institute for Empathy and Compassion. Very pleased to be with another guest who's really making a very positive contribution to our well-being as healthcare providers and also just more generally. I'm with my co-host Nyla Chowdhury, who's from UC Extension, the Director of Social Impact and Innovation. Nyla, will you introduce our guest, please? Thank you, Dr. Mobley. Today's guest is Dr. John Mattison. He's currently working on COVID-19 policy, diagnostics, and critical care. He's also an expert in health technology, virtual care, telemedicine, and health informatics. Dr. Mattison is the former chief medical information officer at Kaiser Permanente. He's guided by service to others, and actively pursues the convergence of science and spirituality. It is such a pleasure to welcome you, John. Thank you for taking time to be with us. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. Thank you so much. And uh, as a personal friend, I have to say, it's, it's a true privilege to uh, share the, the uh, discussion with you. And would you like to share with our viewers your life's journey, your work, and the present situation of social impact and COVID-19? Sure. So uh, I grew up in several different worlds. Uh, my father was a surgeon in a town of 28,000 people, uh, Steinbeck country, Salinas, California. And my mother's whole family were farmers and ranchers in the central coast of California. And I lived in two very, very different worlds, and it gave me the opportunity to really see how different people view life differently and have different values and, and live their lives in ways that are more meaningful to them. And so I was studying to be a marine biologist and an evolutionary biologist at the last minute, decided to go into medicine, went into medicine, practiced seven specialties and, uh, and in different practices, and uh, then was drafted to begin leading the health information technology at Kaiser Permanente. Along that journey, in, in a parallel track, um, I was raised in a very religious family um, and I really didn't entirely embrace the, the cultural aspects of the religion as opposed to spirituality. And in the last five to 10 years, I've had a series of transformational events that have uh, really helped me embrace and embody the spirituality um, in ways that um, have motivated me to change many, many things in my life. And your comment about the convergence of science and spirituality, as you know, is one of my passions because I believe that there are uh, forces of physics that we simply do not understand as of this point in time that will help bridge that gap so that people who cannot today embrace the, the key aspects of spirituality will be able to see physical evidence of the underpinning of what represents our connectedness. I believe that we are it, deeply connected with each other all over the planet with each other, with, with others in our immediate environment, as well as across the world. And I think what's happening with COVID right now is really um, setting a, a, it's resetting the framework for humanity in, in my mind, because what we're seeing is as we become so distracted with all the technology and just staring at our screens all day long and, and seeing people in restaurants, not talking to each other, but, but texting somebody else far away, it's really become an impediment to how we're connected. And I think that what's happening with, with COVID is we're realizing that uh, paradoxically that the, the same connection that this virus has globally and spreading to, and treating pretty much every culture the same um, we are all connected in the same way. And some of the responses we're seeing, we have never seen the scientific community pull together and collaborate the way it has now. It's stunning to see how much of the research on COVID is being shared instantly and openly around the world and how people are collaborating on, on diagnostics and on therapeutics in ways that are unprecedented. And so I think 
that this connection between the, the collaboration and the connectedness that people are feeling around this common threat of the COVID pandemic is causing us to go back to our roots, back to the basics of ancient wisdom of how we're all connected. If you look at any of the uh, ancient philosophies and, and uh, even in indigenous tribes around the world, they all have this deep sense of connectedness because they have a sense of community that hasn't been disrupted by technology and disrupted by the digital transformation. And because of that, they maintain a very close connection with how we are all connected with each other and responsible for each other. And they see themselves as part of a community, not an individual competing with others online, but someone who's part of a community. And I think that we have a huge opportunity in the old saying of never let a good crisis go to waste. I think the most important thing about what's happening with COVID right now is it's bringing many people to realize that we have allowed technology to rule our lives rather than the reverse of using technology for the betterment. So when I say I like to use technology to restore empathy and ancient wisdom, I believe it's absolutely possible and nowhere more so than in healthcare. So we're passing through this era of rapid digital transformation in healthcare, which is disrupting everything and everybody. And we're losing a lot of the art and the kindness and the compassion and the empathy and the love that is necessary to be part of being a healer. And I think now that we have this, this time to rethink everything, why do I go to work? What am I doing? What is my purpose in life? Everybody needs a purpose. And I think one of the key aspects of purpose is that uh, if, you, if you look at what underpins happiness, it's, it's just a couple of simple things. It's having something to contribute to our community. It's feeling good about how we contribute to the community. It's being recognized for contributing to the community. And that sense of purpose is what drives us. And so much of what technology has done is it's taken that purpose away from us. And I think we really need to think very carefully about how we restore purpose and dignity, because after all, no dignity, no purpose, no happiness, no sense of belonging. And I, th I think we're on the cusp of a major reset of what it means to be human and part of the larger human community. You know, I hope, John, I hope you're right about that because certainly we need those things, this physical connectedness, the physics of connectedness. And yet when we bring digital tools out, sometimes they make things worse, not better. So you know, we think of the, the physician staring at the computer screen instead of watching the patient and listening to the patient. And they're doing that because the computer screen has become the third you know, if you will, the 900-pound the, the gorilla in the room when physicians are trying to connect with their patients. I think it's been a huge problem. In fact, it's a source of burnout. It's, it's a source of all those, of, of frustrating all those motives that you've just spoken about. And you've been part of that. And it's very important to hear from you about what you've done, especially at Kaiser, to really make a difference, to really actually uh, restore that physician-patient relationship in spite of the fact that there's a digital health record being used. Absolutely, and I'd like to, to give some credit to two uh, real pioneers in thinking about this. One is Sherry Turkle uh, at MIT who wrote the book years ago called Alone Together about exactly this issue of people staring at screens instead of talking to each other. And the other is a researcher in Scandinavia called Uriel Engström, who 25 years ago was uh, doing ethnographic research on the relationship of the physician and the patient and how bringing the computer into the room as an object, is it a tool or is it a rule? Does it help or does it impair? And so the other person I'd like to credit is Don Norman, who's in, at, at UCSD and who's invented uh, this human-centered design notion of how do we make the technology work for us rather than the other way around. And one of his graduate sc students 20 years ago, uh, I invited her to come and she did her thesis, her uh, doctoral dissertation 
in our offices at Kaiser Permanente videotaping the interaction between patients, physicians, and computers, and then her entire PhD thesis is about that interaction. We have since migrated from that electronic health record to one of the most common ones, EPIC. And we found for the first six, seven, eight years that doctors identified the health record as the biggest stress to them, the biggest cause of burnout. And as we all know, physicians around the world are burning out with electronic health records. What we've had the luxury of at Kaiser Permanente is to have a team that, and, and a CEO, uh, several uh, CEOs who have been very dedicated to this notion of how do we address this problem head on. And we have taken great pains to ensure that we do everything possible to adapt the electronic health record and all of our systems. We have, we have literally thousands of, of software systems we use in support of our members. And we have taken that, that team and applied them to that work. And just last week, we did a standardized survey um, that is being issued to healthcare institutions around the country and looked at uh, aspects of burnout, aspects of stress, aspects of satisfaction with the health record and the support. And to the surprise of many, not to my surprise, but to the surprise of many, it showed that physicians are still highly stressed, uh, uh, very high burnout rate, but they are no longer attributing it to the electronic health record because the team at Kaiser Permanente has, has done an extraordinary job with the support of our CEO and, and our leadership to minimize how much the human has to adapt to the computer and how much the computer assists the human. And there's still a long ways to go. We have many more things in our roadmap to ease that pain and ease that burden. But we actually take, we identify physicians who are struggling. We take them out of office and we put them through a, a refresher course to teach them uh, really simple tricks to make their lives easier. And I can't tell you how many physicians have literally at the end of a two day course broke down sobbing and saying, I was going to leave medicine. I couldn't take it anymore. You saved my career. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And so Ken Robinson is our physician who's leading those efforts, has published on this and made many presentations. But it is possible to reverse the poison that comes with the digital transformation and convert it into something that allows physicians to do what they should be doing, which is listening and being empathic and being compassionate and understanding where people are coming from and how do we, how do we identify what their values and goals are, not our values and goals. And, and one of the things I love to say is non-compliance is the most absurd word in the a medical lexicon. Non-compliance means the doctor has failed to educate the patient, to understand the patient well enough, to educate them well enough to be compliant. So I see non-compliance as a failure of the physician, not the failure of the patient. The other phrase that I take exception to is patient-centric. So it's all the buzz to say, let's be patient-centric. Well, a patient is what doctors call people. And it's an oxymoron. It's it's a two-word oxymoron. Patient-centric is not um, a, an adequate characterization because patients have much broader lives than the list of diseases and the lists of medications and their lists of allergies. So how do we use the technology to make it more efficient for the physician to listen, understand the values and goals of an individual, and adapt what they want to give them through the lens of compassion and kindness and empathy and understanding in ways that have been stripped away by the distraction of the technology. And this is not only possible, but we're seeing it happen before our very eyes. Uh, uh, on, the, on the journey to the state where the technology is out of the way and what's center, central to the human patient, the physician patient relationship again, we're 10% of the way there. We have, we have 10 times as much more to do than we've already done. But what we've done in the past 10 years to, to relieve that pain on the physician and to, re, and to enable them to engage more with the patient is far better than it was four or five years ago, but we still have 10 times farther to go. And, and we have a roadmap and we have um, a path and we have the support of our leadership to do just that.
It's great news, and, and I'm hoping that th that those lessons can be broadly applied so that um, though we continue to deal with challenges with patient care and with challenges around physician burden to uh, give care, that the electronic health record gets out of our way and instead really actually helps us connect. Nyla, I, I think you must have another question for our guest. Um, looking at the new normal, I wanted to ask John that how do we nourish our mental health for ourselves, our families and friends and communities? It's the toughest thing and it's unpredictable of how long the social isolation will go on. And that's, that is really the question of the moment uh, because so many families are suffering. So many people who have had issues in their relationships that haven't been addressed and now they're locked up together in their homes without access to mental health care. So, uh, and, and there, is, there, was a, there was a profound need for better support for relationships and families prior to COVID. And what COVID has done is, is it's amplified it and it's isolated us further within those nuclear units. And so what a lot of people are doing globally, and this is one of the beautiful things that's coming out of this reset um, for humanity coming emerging out of COVID, is that there are many people who are developing virtual care services for, for counseling and mental health and behavioral health. And I hope that anybody who is struggling at home takes advantage of what was previously unavailable. So one of the big switches we're seeing in healthcare is we used to do 80 to 90% of our visits in person and 10 to 20% through virtual care. But because people don't want to come to the clinic, either the healthcare workers or the patients because of the fear of acquiring COVID, we're seeing that inverted to where we're seeing 80% of our care being delivered remotely through virtual care and telemedicine. And in that context, we're getting far better at understanding what it takes to connect. And the fascinating thing is, is that when we're looking face to face, doctor and patient on a video visit, there's actually more connection than there was in the office. As Dr. Mobley alluded to, they're looking at the computer instead of the patient. Well, now when they look at their computer, they are looking at the patient. So there's this profound irony that this physical distancing has actually reduced this, the social distancing in many ways. It has not been scaled yet anywhere close to what it will be. But this reset it has driven so much care into the virtual care, which, oh, by the way, makes it a lot easier to be seen. You don't have to leave, find a babysitter and leave the kids at home. You don't have to get an excuse at work to leave for a half day to go find a parking spot and wait in line and wait uh, to see the physician. You can get an appointment and you spend exactly the amount of time in the appointment that the appointment lasts and all of the transportation, everything else is gone. So it's making it far more convenient. And at the same time, the time you spend with a physician, you're looking them in the eye. It's, it's this extraordinary irony of the physical distancing actually helping re remove some of the social distance of what's been happening in face-to-face -face visits for all the reasons Dr. Mobley identified earlier. John, we really thank you for your work. I, I just want to quote from your bio, your bio by, ask, by thanking you for the emphasis that you have on, in quotes, using modern technology to restore empathy in ancient wisdom. What a great, what a great goal and how important uh, it is to us now uh, and will be in the future. And we, again, thank you for being on the program. It's been a real privilege and an honor. Thank you so much. And I appreciate what you're doing in the Center for Compassion at UCSD. Um, that's remarkable and, and desperately needed at this time. Thanks so much, John.